months away, and I did miss you a lot, but I'm, I'm here with, with a word today, and uh, I, I have to confess to you that I had about five or six different ideas of what I was going to preach to you, but because it is Life Church, um, I didn't actually write the message that I was going to preach to you, to, that I'm about to preach to you, until five o'clock this morning. Um, and, and in fact, it's so fresh that I didn't even have time to type it. I have, I have these little white notepads that Rachel Smith puts in my, in my box on my desk. And I'm so thankful for these because in meetings they help me kind of jot memories and, and thoughts and questions down. And uh, I didn't have time to type my notes today. So I have, I have eight of these. That's, so let's, let's see what happens. <laughs> So I'm excited about this word, though. This is actually uh, about one of my favorite characters in all of Scripture. Um, one of them, my favorite character, his name is Jesus. But uh, one of my other favorite characters, you find him in the book of 2 Kings. Uh, his name is Elisha. Say Elisha. Elisha. Elisha was the uh, successor to a guy named Elijah. Say Elijah. Elijah. Okay, so Elijah was... The, the, the prophet to the people of Israel, and he uh, was famously, if you, if you know his story, he did a, a bunch of miracles, and then God took him up in a chariot of fire into heaven. So Elijah didn't actually die. He was so awesome that God wanted him in heaven. Uh, he, he, he took him up in a chariot of fire. Now, Elisha said, hey, I'm going to ask you something pretty audacious, because he was serving Elijah for somewhere between 7 to 20 years as his cupbearer, just following him around, learning by the way, if you want to go into ministry, find somebody who does ministry well and just follow them around a lot. Uh, if you want to go into ministry and you think you're just going to go and do ministry, nah, nah. Find somebody you respect and somebody who has something that you want. Just follow them around. That's what Elisha did for somewhere between 7 to 20 years. So that happened. And, and at the end of this season, Elisha looks at his, his, his master, his teacher, uh, and he says, I want twice the anointing that you have. Yeah. <laughs> That's bold. That's audacious, right? So he says, I want two times what you have. I want a double portion. And Elijah says, all right, fine, cool. Hang out. And uh, if you see me when I'm taken up to heaven, then you'll get what you ask for, right? And sure enough, Elisha doesn't let anything stop him. And he hangs out with him. And he, and he sees Elijah when he's taken up. And he gets the double portion of Elijah's anointing. That's kind of the context to set the tone for the very first miracle that Elisha does in his ministry. And that's the story that I want to share with you today in 2 Kings chapter 2, starting in verse 19. I want to read to you a few verses here that are the context or the telling of Elisha's first ministry miracle. You ready? It says here, uh, in verse 19, on the day, on one day, the leaders of the town of Jericho visited Elisha. We have a problem, my Lord, they told him. This town is located in pleasant surroundings, as you can see. But the water is bad and the land is unproductive. Pause there for a second. I just want to tell you the message that I'm going to preach to you is going to impact you on two levels. I believe that this is a word for us communally. And when I say us, I mean the people of this Antelope Valley. I think that the Lord is actually saying something to the people who live in this community. Uh, and, and, I, and you'll understand what I mean as I share through some of the things that the Lord put on my heart for you this morning. But this is a word for us. It's, it's a word for us as a people called Life Church. It's a word for us as residents of this community. But the second thing that I want you to understand is that this is a word for you as well. So look to your neighbor real quick and just touch him on the shoulder real quick and say, hey, listen, this word is for you. Good, good. Now, in case they're still sleeping, tell your other neighbor real quick. This word is for you. Good. So did they get it? Everybody ready? Okay. This word is for you. The leaders of this town called Jericho, they come with hopelessness. Wrapped in a pretty package. This word is for us as people who live in the Antelope Valley because we're people wrapped in a pretty package. You ever tell somebody who lives in a different state where you live? How do you do it? If you're far away, you say, I live in LA. Right? 
Look, I've traveled a lot this month. I was in Seattle recently, and I was trying to tell people where I was with other ministers, and they were going, oh, where do you serve? And I go, Lancaster. Oh, Pennsylvania? No. No, the other one, the one you haven't heard of. Where's that? Oh, it's in L.A. Oh, you live in L.A.? Well, no. You, have you had this conversation? Right? You just go, I live in L.A. I live in L.A. County. I live in the northernmost tip of L.A. County. I live in the Mojave Desert. I live, here's another descriptor, I live about an hour and a half north of L.A. Right? And the about part is because some of you speed. <laughs> I live 12 minutes from Los Angeles downtown. <laughs> we are swift of foot. Sinner. It's funny when you tell someone you live in SoCal. Oh, do you surf? Nah, bro. <laughs> No, I don't surf. There's sharks in that water. I live in the desert. This word is for us. Listen to the way they describe their community. One day the leaders of the town of Jericho visited Elisha. We have a problem, my lord. They told him, this town is located in pleasant surroundings. They didn't say, this is a nice town to live in. They didn't say that. They said it's located in pleasant surroundings. Everywhere you see. I was describing this community. Uh, someone said, well, what are the kinds of things that you do in the Alabama? And I said, we, we go snowboarding. We drive away to the mountains to go snowboarding. So one of the great things about living in the Alabama Valley, you're two hours max from anything you want to do. Right? You can go fishing. Camping, you can go hiking. I don't know why you want to do any of those things, but you can go snowboarding. You could go surfing, right? You could you you could go hang gliding. Again, I don't know why, but you could. Within the general vicinity of where you live, in the surroundings, there's a lot of nice things to do, right? But do you ever just struggle to go, man? But what do you do in your city? But what's nice to do in your city? Well, there's lots of nice people there. <laughs> cool. Well, what does your community do to, like, gather those people around? <laughs> uh, we built a freeway that goes to L.A. <laughs> Praise the maker. <laughs> now, don't get me wrong. There are some nice things to do in this community. But uh, the general tone and the vibe of people who live in the Yellow Valley is that if you want anything fun to do, if you want anything good to do, you, you have to have a driver's license or know somebody that has one, and you have to leave town, right? See, we live in a community that it said the, the surroundings are pleasant, but the water is bad, and the land is unproductive. I don't even know if we have water in this city. If we do, you're not allowed to use it. It's bad. It's bad. The water's bad. And the land is unproductive. Now, I'm talking to a community mentality, but I think maybe I'm also talking to some individuals. Have you ever felt like, man, everybody else around you looks like they got nice things? Let's put this in a church context. Sure does seem like everybody around is getting their breakthrough. Where's mine? See, the water in my life is bad. The land of my heart is unproductive. So I'm talking on a corporate community level today, but I think that the Lord is also going to be talking to us on an individual level as well. And I wonder if as we walk through this story together today, that we can ask ourselves, where are the places in our community? And where are the places in our personal lives that feel as if we would say, you know what, everything around looks beautiful, but on the inside I'm dying. It might, and, I, and I might look good on the outside, but in here, it doesn't look good at all. 
So that's my challenge for you today as we move through this word. Lord, would you help us to hear your word today? Would you change our lives forever by the power of your word? In Jesus' name. Amen. Let me read to you the next thing that happens in this story, and then we'll start to break it down a little bit more. In verse 20, it says, Eli Elisha said, so he, he responds back to the people. He says, bring me a new bowl with salt in it. So they brought it to him. Then he went out to the spring that supplied the town with the water and threw the salt into it. He said, this is what the Lord says. I have purified this water. It will no longer cause death or infertility. And the water has remained pure ever since. Amen. That's a good word. I believe that that's a, a word for us. He asks for a bowl with some salt in it. Just wanted you visual learners to be able to see what that might have looked like. I'm talking to me, really. I, I needed to be able to have this in front of me so I could remember what I was talking about today. He says, a bowl. did you know that there are, you could Google uses for salt? And there's a lot of them. Like just one list, like the second list if you Googled uses for salt. It says 60 quick things you could use salt for. I did not know this. Apparently you could use salt to clean the bottom of your iron. I didn't know you could do that. You do have to use the iron. I didn't know that if you had a, a ring from having left a glass on your wood countertops, like your kitchen island, that you could actually use salt to rub that out. I just found that out. And I'm really excited because I have a kitchen island with a wood top. There's a big old nasty ring right on the corner of it. And I'm so excited and I know this means my wife's going to make me do it, but I'm so excited that, that we're going to get to try that out. We're going to put some salt on a warm dish towel and, and scrub out the ring. Did you know that salt could do that? There's tons of uses for salt. Elisha understands that salt is very useful. He understands the usefulness of salt. And so he says, bring me a bowl with some salt. Now, let me... Let me pause here, actually, and break down some of the elements of this story so that you fully understand the context and the implication of what's going on. Uh, just so that you understand, as we study Elisha and his ministry and his personhood, who, who he was in, this, in the great story of Scripture, we actually understand that Elisha is a prophetic representation. He's like foreshadowing of the New Testament church. So the ministry and the style and the, the, the functionality of Elisha is, is supposed to represent the kinds of things that New Testament churches are supposed to do. So he represents the leadership. He represents the structures. He represents the, the ministry of the New Testament church. You're sitting in one of those churches, so you know. So, so, so Elisha represents life church. He represents us. He represents the, 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 the structure, the organization, if you will, of the New Testament church. Now, the leaders, uh, I've kind of already said this a little bit, but just to make it really clear, the leaders of the community of Jericho represent those who carry a consensus of hopelessness. Now, the consensus of hopelessness isn't just an idea about hopelessness. It's that we've thought about it and we've chosen to believe that hopelessness is the prevailing idea in this territory. There's enough of us who say the Antelope Valley is a place where dreams come to die. That we just believe it. Right? And that guy laughed because he's heard somebody say it before. I've heard somebody, I've said it. You understand? It's the consensus. The leaders represent the consensus. Well, what if you're not talking about a community? You're talking about individuals. It still represents the consensus. The consensus that your spirit and your soul and your mind have all come to accept and be submitted to. Now, your spirit and your soul know truth because they were designed in God's image, but they submit to whatever truth you, you speak. Right, right. Amen? Yeah. 
Uh, if you want to understand more about what I just said, go back and listen to some messages where I talk about Proverbs 18, 21. The Bible teaches us that death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The circle of life is when you speak life and you produce the harvest of life in your own life. But the circle of death is when you join in with the consensus of death and you say, I'm, I'm hopeless as an individual. I will never be a good husband. I will never be a good spouse. I, I will never be a good employee. I will never be successful. I will never understand true happiness. I will never. That, that's consensus talking. You've thought about it. You've decided to lack hope. Which is a choice. Everything else around you can look wonderful and you can decide, nope, but we are the barren land. It's a choice. The bowl and the salt represents the believer who carries the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Do you ever remember a little saying that Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, right? He goes on to give some warnings and some instructions and some other kind of identifying markers of who we are as people. But one of the things that Jesus equates us to is salt. He says, you are the salt. So the bowl and the salt represent the believer who carries the good news, the, the, the culture changing uh, coefficient of, of, of who you are and who Jesus has made you to be combined together to uh, have some kind of molecular structure that has the ability to scrub stains off of wood. That's who you are if you're a believer, right? So with that in mind, take a look back at what Elisha says. Elisha representing the church. The leaders representing the ones who carry the consensus of hopelessness and the bowl and the salt representing the individual believers who carry the good news. He says, bring me a new bowl with salt in it. A couple of things to notice. He says, you bring me the bowl. The church's job is not to resource every problem to be fixed. The church's job, it says in Ephesians chapter 4, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. Good work. So he equipped the saints. Elisha made an assumption. The assumption was, you already possess what you need to fix this problem. Why? Because you know the same God I do. Because you've got salt in you. Right? So, so he said, I already know you have a bowl and salt. Bring me what you have. Yeah. You present it. God will never fix your problem unless you're prepared to make a sacrifice of something you have. Yeah. You understand? Yeah. And by the way, this just tastes bitter until it gets used to make something better. I, and I know that because I had to test this morning if this was sugar or salt. <laughs> Robert Clark was in the kitchen when I did it. And he wanted to know if I bit my tongue or... And then he goes, why did you put that much in your mouth? <laughs> you could have used less and found out. I don't know. I just go all in. <laughs> The church planter in me, I guess. <laughs> Notice what else he says. He says, bring me the bowl. You've got to present it. It's got to be your partnership. You've got to be willing to sacrifice something of your own resource to be equipped. Right? But he also says, bring me a new bowl. Why did it have to be a new bowl? Because if it had already been used in the context of hopelessness, it would have hopelessness on it. So he needed a bowl that hadn't been marked by hopelessness. That hadn't been marked by the prevailing, the consensus of the context. Right? Bring me a new bowl. By the way, a new bowl doesn't mean it, doesn't mean it had to be made right now. He's not saying God will only use new believers. He's saying... He's going to use people who are not marked by the consensus of the context. Because you can't change a culture if you're like the culture. Right? So I, I, don't need, I don't need you to send me people with hopelessness. I need you to send me the new bowl. The one who actually has a chance to make a difference. Why? Because it is 
different. Yeah, yeah. And what's in it? The salt. The thing that actually changes the culture. The believer is just the carrier of the salt. That's right. right? Right? You understand? Bring me a new bowl. Bring me somebody who, who ha- doesn't have dust in their gears yet. My mentor has told me over and over and over again, Tim, if you serve in the Antelope Valley long enough, if you don't take care of your heart, this place has a way of getting sand in your gears. And you know what? I know ministers who have served not caring for their heart because they're constantly feeling like they have to pour out and pour out and pour out and be the resource and not ask for the bowl to to be sent, but to be the only bowl in the church. And more and more of those people are doing something called burning out. You know why I don't burn out in ministry? It's not because the work isn't hard. The work is hard. People are broken, and it's hard to work with broken people. I have a hard job. Ministers have a hard job. It's so hard, we have an entire month to honor them. A month out of 12. Because we have a hard job. I'm not saying we have the only hard job in the world. I'm just saying this is one. For the record, I don't sit around at my desk waiting for you to call with problems all day. There's a lot of stuff to be done. Yes. And if you did call with your problems, Mark Rondeau is here having launched a ministry called Biblical Guidance. And he's got a team of people ready to help you. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> but the reason why I haven't burned out in ministry is because I'm taking care of this heart. So that the bowl can stay new. Because if the bowl gets old, the salt in it will just lose its flavor. Matthew 5 says, you are the salt of the earth. But what good is salt if it loses its flavor? You might as well just throw it on the ground and trample it under your feet. Right? So he says, bring me a new bowl with salt in it. Somebody willing to fresh, and ready to be used by God. Are you? Are you a new bowl? Or are you cracked? Or are you covered with the stuff of the community? Because you have to be different. Let's stop trying to be relevant. Right? Amen. Speak the gospel in a language the world can understand. But if nobody's ever offended by your speaking of the gospel, you're probably not really speaking the gospel. Because Jesus said they would hate you for his name, right? So he needs new bowls. New bowls. No wonder the old bowls, this is why, this is why there's jealousy in the church, because the old bowl doesn't like that the new bowl gets used all the time. Nobody wants to put your ugly china up on the table. <laughs> Right? When you have the fancy people to your house, you get out the good china and then you polish it because we all know you didn't use it in a long time. But you polish it up and you put that out and you pretend like that's the stuff you use all the time. Right? And meanwhile, your old bowl's up in the cupboard getting jealous. Right? Preach it. This, this is why there's jealousy in the church. Because we allow for the old bowl to be used. Because we don't want them to feel bad. By the way, that's called the fear of man. And when ministers allow the old bowl to be used, churches mirror the community and nothing happens and we become irrelevant. We have to use a new bowl so that it stands out. Right? And the old bowl will get jealous. And maybe they'll work through their jealousy and become a new bowl. And then they can be used too. Right? Amen? All right. I wasn't planning on preaching that sermon today, but let's keep moving. So he gives us some steps. Number one, he says, bring me a new bowl. And so they bring him a new bowl. And the second step is that he goes to the water. 
Uh, let's actually read what it says. In verse 20, he says, uh, bring me a new bowl. Then, verse 21, then he went out to the spring that supplied, say supplied, the spring that supplied the town with the water and threw the salt into it. Into what? Into the spring that supplied the town with water. And then he told them, now the water is going to be purified. And guess what? It was. Praise the Lord. Here's the second thing that we have to understand from this whole thing, this whole story. Uh, we need a new bowl. We need it to have salt in it. And then it is the church's job to release the salt through the vessel. That's the church's job. To do what? To equip the saints for what? The work of the ministry. He didn't, he didn't bless the salt and then go, okay, now if you put this on your steak, everything will be fine. He didn't, he didn't say that. Notice that he also didn't say, if you put this on your veggies, we'll be good. He also didn't say, if you sprinkle this on your ground where you're trying to farm, it will miraculously grow. He went to the spring that supplied water to the entire community. And he put the salt at the source. Right? Our ministry is not effective when we put bandages on symptoms. You can put a good word at the wrong place and not fix the problem. It has to be a rightly applied word to see change. So if Elisha had just sprinkled the salt on the ground, nothing would have changed. He had to go to the source. Right? But this is why in ministry, we have to dig deep down into heart issues and figure out what's really going on under the surface. I know you're acting like a fool, but why are you really acting? Oh, you're just scared. I know you yell a lot, but you're just hurt. I know you're greedy, but you're just afraid. Right? You got to go down to the root. What's the fear that there wouldn't be pure water? That God's not really a provider. So what did he do? He purified the source. How did he do it? He asked for a new bowl with salt in it. And the church sprinkled it at the source. So the church's job is to go, let me show you the source. It's right here. Go ahead and get to work. Yeah? Now, if you, if you feel like your church is too focused on a specific topic, it's because they've found a source and they're pointing it out. Maybe you should celebrate that. If you feel like your church is just sprinkling salt all over the ground, maybe you should just hang tight and wait until you find the right source. Everybody wants a church to do everything. Churches aren't called to do everything. Churches are called to equip the saints to put salt on the source. Right? Right? That's our job. It's not put in the stream. It's not put on the ground. It's put at the root. Amen? So what does that look like for your personal life? It means you bring the good news. What's the good news? Jesus. The word of God. The gospel. You bring love. You speak the truth in love to the root. Amen? That's good, right? Is that helping anybody so far? Because there's more. Because this is the part where the story gets a little weird. If it's not weird already, it's about to get weird. All right? And I'm going to be honest with you. When I first read this this week, I thought, Lord, don't make me preach that because that's weird. I'm just going to be honest. But then this morning at 5 a.m., he told me what he means. In verse 23, the story goes on. Verses 23 through 25. This is, I'm, I'm telling you, it gets weird. Just get ready. It's going to be weird. But this is in the Bible. Elisha left Jericho. Say he left. So he did a thing. And then he went on to the next thing. Just context. Okay. He did a thing and he's walking. He went up to Bethel. As he was walking along the road... A group of boys from the town began mocking him and making fun of him. 
You ever just feel like you're on your way somewhere, God was doing something, and then the devil comes and distracts you? This is Elisha's story right now. He did something awesome, and between miracle one and miracle two, this story happens, and it's nothing more than a distraction. But these boys begin mocking him, making fun of him. Go away, Baldy! They chanted. That was messed up. <laughs> Go away, Baldy! Let's put that in context just so you understand. Because the thing that Elisha is about to do... Ah, let me just read it to you. It needs to have the same shock value it did for me the first time. Verse 24. Elisha turned around and looked at them. Here it comes. He cursed them in the name of the Lord. What a nice guy. <laughs> Then, say then. then, then two bears, in one translation it says two female bears. I don't know why that matters, but it just happens to be two lady bears. Maybe so this seems even more baller. Then two mama bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of them. Forty-two dudes. It's a little weird. And then here's Elisha's response to this incredible moment. From there, Elisha went to Mount Carmel and finally returned to Samaria. He didn't. He, he didn't gather community support groups. He didn't pick at the bear farm. He, he didn't say bears are bad. Come on. Did you, hear, did you hear the third one? He did not start a campaign. Hashtag bears bad news. <laughs> two bears killed 42 guys and he didn't say all bears are from the pit of hell. Just because two bears did something bad doesn't mean all the bears are bad. I heard one pastor say recently that he's tired of being judged because there's some people who stand by, behind a pulpit and say dumb stuff. Just because there's some people who stand behind pulpits and say stuff that isn't true doesn't mean that nobody who stands behind a pulpit is saying anything true. Right? There's probably some more illustrations I could use that are more on the nose to our cultural context and climate, like maybe not all police officers are bad. You know, are there some bad ones? Okay. Some bad school teachers. Still send your kids there. Some bad doctors, but when your arm's falling off. Right? Just, just, I mean, that was a freebie. But just so you know, not all bears are bad. Okay, I'm not done. Just, just because some white people don't get it, don't mean none of us do. And just because some black people don't know how to sit down and have a conversation because they're angry, doesn't mean that none of them do. Right? By the way, the answer to the questions that I just raised is found in Daniel chapter 9. When Daniel, being a righteous man, got on his knees and wept and mourned and repented for the sins of the people of his entire nation, even though he had committed zero of those offenses. That's the answer. When we all repent together. Oh, but I wasn't one of them. You're one of us. Repent. Right? You can't ask God to forgive a national sin if you don't take responsibility for it on your own. Now, stop distracting me with bears. <laughs> Let me explain the weird thing. First of all, Elisha is not just a mean guy who sees a bunch of kids running around, you know, saying something kind of stupid. And then, like, he flips out and says, well, fine, you're going to die. Bears be upon you. Hey, that's not what happened. This, this group of young men, if you study the original language, was actually a group of idolatrous 
young people. They were a group of people who together worshipped false gods publicly. These are the kinds of young people who would go around mocking other religions. Public, openly, they were bold and confident, courageous about their personal faith and their belief in a false god. And, and when they said, go away, Baldy, if you study the original language, that's, that's not just some like fifth grade insult. What they were actually saying in the original language, they were saying, hey, you go up too. You go up. Here's what they meant. Elijah was taken up in a chariot and these guys went, yes, he's gone. And then Elisha shows up with double portion and they go, oh man. So they see him after having performed his first ministry miracle and they go, we want you dead just like we think he is. It was a death threat from a group of at least 42 men. And I think it was probably more than that, because if it was exactly 42, then the bears would have just killed all of them. Right? All of them. But it killed 42 of them. Specific number means there was more of them than 42. You understand? It is a death threat. Elisha turned around and he looked at them and he cursed them in the name of the Lord. Now again, this is not the most helpful translation. If you actually read the original context, if you read the, the, the narrative for its cultural understanding, if you put it into its cultural context, you understand that what happened is Elisha turns around and because of their behavior, he declared, you are cursed. You are vile, is what he said. You are a cursed person. You're a cursed group. What, what he did not say was, you are cursed, therefore bears are going to come and eat your face. He didn't say that. He turned around and because of their behavior, you are cursed. <coughs> the church's job is to do signs and wonders and to move from one sign towards the next. And at some point, some jokers over here are going to distract the church and the people of God, the people who are pouring salt on the source. Here's a source. We're going to pour salt here. Oh, we see another one over here. We're going to go pour salt over here on this source. And somewhere on the journey from source to source, from miracle to miracle, the mockers will come. And they will always come. They will mock the work of God, the people of God. Why? Because they're afraid of you. The church's job in that moment is not to attack. The church's job is to, watch this, give momentary attention. Because the scripture says he turned and faced them. And he cursed them in the name of the Lord. And then, little parenthetical aside about some bears... And verse 25 says, from there Elisha went to Mount Carmel and finally returned to Samaria. So, miracle, journey, distraction, yes. moment of attention. I'm declaring the truth about you. Because you're vile. Now that's not going to stand. I don't receive what you're saying. Yes. No. In the name of the Lord. I gotta go. That's the church's job. The problem is that a lot of us don't continue the church's job at verse 25. We assume that verse 24 is also our job. That verse 24 is he turned and cursed. And then also now we have to make sure that they die. Scripture doesn't say that Elisha called the bears. By the way, there are stories where the prophet actually declares specifically what is going to happen. 
and the, the absence of a declaration of Elisha saying bears are going to come and eat 42 of you means that he turned and told them the truth about their action and therefore their identity because they were mocking the work of God. And then he went back about his business. And then God handled his. So here's the lesson. If God feels like killing 42 people with two female bears, you go ahead and just let God do that. And you keep walking. It's not your business. It's not your story to tell. It's not your ministry. There's nobody in the kingdom of heaven in the New Testament church whose ministry is to summon bears to kill mockers. If Elisha didn't do it, neither do you. The church's job, your job, when you have the mockers, because you know, as they say, haters going to hate, is to shake it off. <laughs> and just keep walking. That's your job. Amen? Amen. Man, I preached all these and I need to look at them. <laughs> Got that one too? All right. Last page. <laughs> Last written page. <laughs> the question is, how do, how do we respond to a word like this? And I think it's twofold. Number one, we have to respond as a community. Right? And then we have to respond as individuals. So let's wrestle with the community response for just a minute. I believe that God has purified the waters of this community. And I'm saying that in a very specific way. Uh, I believe that God has, say has, has, he has purified the waters of this valley. He has done it. And as a result, we are Fruitful people. That's a prophetic declaration. When I was reading through this earlier in the week, I, I felt like the Lord was saying, there's something in here. And it wasn't until about 5 a.m. this morning that it suddenly dawned on me. This is our story. What is it? It's when in other cities, listen to this. In other cities, when they shoot the police officers, somebody's rioting. I've said it with my own mouth, and I've heard other ministers and other, other people say it. This community is just one bullet away from being Ferguson. Felt like that. And then when it comes to our neighborhood, when all the stuff that was going on, police officers being shot, uh, questionable uh, results. Who, who knows what's really going on in various different scenarios. Uh, when... when when crazy drama hits our community, and, and we're not without drama, we understand that, right? Like you all know that our nurses just went on strike. You, you were praying for that, right? When that happened, when Sergeant Stephen Owen gets shot and killed in the line of duty, we don't riot, we united. Now that doesn't happen in a place that is actually hopeless. And so I propose to you that we're not fighting for hope. That we're actually living in the revival that God has promised for us to do. Otherwise we'd be in the middle of riots right now. We'd be in the middle of actual hopelessness right now. So you can walk around feeling like, oh, it's all great everywhere else in Southern California, but not here. This is the place where dreams come to die. You're talking about a past that God has buried. Because he's been pouring salt in the source that brings water to this community for decades. And I am telling you that God sent me here this morning to declare to Life Church and to the Antelope Valley that the season of fruitfulness is done. It's been done. It's over. It's finished. It's behind us. We don't have to live like that anymore. We don't have to live like this is the place where dreams come to die. We now have. 
to live. Have to live. Like this is the place where dreams are given birth to. And I understand that the clapping died out at that point. Because everything around you feels like... Just waiting for the other shoe to drop, Pastor Tim. It looks good today. Yeah, I know. I, you know what? I know we didn't riot when he got shot. But that's because he was a white man and he was a police officer. What if the roles were reversed? Then we really would be rioting. Okay, you go ahead and speak death. But history says that God has poured salt in the source of this community. And we are not dead anymore. So now your responsibility is to bring salt into the community and put it in the source. What's the source? Where do you work? Where do you live? What community leaders do you know? We're still a small enough community that if you wanted to, you could meet with the mayor. Oh, you got a word for him? Write it down. Give it to him. Oh, you think the police officers are, are, are scared? Encourage them. You think they don't know if we love them? Buy them a cup of coffee. It's as simple as this. I was in Starbucks at an airport just the other day, and a man in military fatigues walked in. Here's what I did. I got up. I was talking to my dad and my brother. I got up, and I said, I'll be right back. And I ran over, and I gave my card to the lady behind the counter. She was working at Starbucks. If she didn't, if she was going to steal it, I'd just get her fired. She wasn't going to steal it. We had, there's a trust relationship here. It's, it's Starbucks. <laughs> gave her my card, and I said, I'm buying this man whatever he wants. And I went and sat down. And he bought whatever he was going to buy. A couple drinks, his wife was with him, a couple sandwiches. And then the lady brought me my card and my receipt. and said, here you go. And I went, thank you. And then I put that stuff in my wallet. And none of that required me to train for a missions trip. <laughs> I didn't have to plant another church. I didn't have to even lead anybody to Jesus. I just, he, he looked at me puzzled and I went, I just wanted to say thanks for what you do. And that's not a wasted opportunity because it took some salt and I went, there you go. As simple as that. It's a lot easier than we think it is. But you're the salt. Clean up your bowl and go out into the community. That's, that's, the community word. But the real response is the personal one, isn't it? Because the real one is about cleaning up the bowl. The real response is about the places that are dead in my own heart. The places where I feel like that person got healed and I'm still here. Not healed. You saw my mom preach with a tremor in her hand, right? Did you notice the moments where she was standing like this? Yeah? Yeah? I venture to guess that's for a couple of different reasons, probably more for you than her, but um, standing here like this because she's still got a tremor in her hand. And yet the woman will lay hands on the sick and God heals them. I mean, there were healings in this room after she preached the word of God last Sunday. Multiple people gave their lives to Jesus and here she is with Parkinson's preaching the word of God. Oh, so, so you think that because it's, it's a little bit dry in one area of your life that you can't pour salt in somebody else's life? Come on. That's good. Come on. Good word. <laughs> you don't have to be perfect. You, you don't have to be. He didn't say bring me a perfect bowl. He didn't even say bring me your fanciest bowl. He said bring me a new bowl. A new bowl. Go to the cupboard with the new bowls in it. Close your eyes and go, that one's good. Here you go. Put some salt in there. Just be a new bowl. But how do you get to be a new bowl? Salt has many uses. And if you feel 
a little rusty, if you feel a little grimy, if you feel a little hopeless, if you feel like the community you live in, or the hopelessness you live in has just put sand in your gears, then I just want to pray for you right now that God would, would wash you with His saltiness right now. If I'm talking to you and I think you already know exactly who you are, I want to ask you to do something kind of brave and bold. And by the way, it's the brave and bold people that get the real breakthroughs in the kingdom. Because Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven suffers violence and the violent take it by force. Right? So I'm not asking you to sit quietly for your breakthrough. I'm going to ask you to stand for it. So if I'm talking to you as an individual and you're hearing the community stuff, but you're saying there's really something in me, then you're standing. And maybe, maybe this could apply in so many different areas because maybe you feel like the thing in you is that there's a sin issue that you keep dealing with over it. You keep going back to that same thing and you just feel like it's, it's just put a whole layer of filth all over your bowl and you're trying to figure out how do I serve God and I can't even feel the presence of God in my life. It's because you've allowed the layer of filth to come between you and the salt. And so we declare in the name of Jesus that the presence of God who is here right now, God, be the salt in the bowl. Be the salt in the bowl and clean us up. Maybe you feel like you've been worn and used for so long. Maybe you feel like somebody has used you. Maybe somebody abused you. Somebody hurt you. Somebody broke you. And I declare in the name of Jesus, the salt to come into the bowl and make you new.